Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, unschooling mom and author, bringing you interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free Exploring Unschooling ebook, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hello, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 11 of the podcast, and it's the 16th of March, 2016, as I record this intro. In this episode, I talk to Bree Jontry, unschooling mom to 12-year-old Noor. We dive into what unschooling looks like when your child has a chronic illness, as Noor and my youngest son, Michael, have type 1 diabetes. You'll hear us talk about how not being in school when they were diagnosed allowed them to follow a much more flexible management protocol, how fear can color your lives if you let it, and how valuable it has been for them to learn about managing their illness the same way they've been learning about everything else in their unschooling lives by being in control of their days and having the freedom to make choices. But before we get started, a quick update on life around here. This week, I finally sent the manuscript for my next book to my editor. I looked back and saw that I mentioned I was close to doing that three episodes ago. Not as quickly as I initially thought. And in those handful of weeks, I learned more about myself and how I can work better with self-imposed deadlines. Or more rightly, that for me, Goals are super helpful for motivation, but deadlines are not. I seem to need to relearn that lesson every year, so it bodes well, I think, I hope, that I got it out of the way earlier this year. The quote I want to share this week is from Joyce Federal. Unfortunately, most people are convinced that when control fails, it's because they didn't control enough. Control is a big issue that unschooling parents usually need to work through even more so for parents of children with a chronic illness. Some illnesses can quickly become life-threatening, and you feel so protective of your child that you want to control all that you can to keep them safe. For many parents in that situation, if they give their child a bit of leeway and something unexpected happens, their takeaway is that they didn't have enough control, rather than that their child hasn't had enough control up to this point to have more effectively managed that moment. So they reach for even more control, widening the disconnection between parent and child. It's a cycle that, if left to spiral, can get in the way of the child's learning for years, leaving them vulnerable when they get older and have more opportunities to escape that control. If you'd like to read more of what Joyce has to say about unschooling and parenting, you can check out her wonderful website, joyfullyrejoicing.com. And rejoicing is spelled with a Y, like her name. I'll put the link in the show notes. And if you have anything you'd like to share regarding this episode, please head on over to the comments for episode 11 at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. And now, on to the interview. Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca, and today I'm here with Bree Jontry. Hi, Bree. Hi, Pam. It's great to have you on the show. Bree is an unschooling mom I've connected with a few times over the years because we share the experience of having a child who is living with a chronic illness. At first glance, it might seem like you'd need to drop some unschooling principles when your child's health is in question, so I'm excited to speak to Bree about her experience. But first, can you share a little bit about your background and your family? Sure. Um... I st- Nor's always unschooled. Um, I have one child. That's that's it. Um, just Nor, and I think I probably found unschooling when she was mm, maybe around three or four years old. And I knew I was pretty sure at that point that I wanted to homeschool. But I had the I, I had the proverbial sitting at the kitchen table learning Greek kind of um, (laughs) image in my head. I think at that, at that point in time, um, I come from, from a well-educated academic background. Um, I'm, I'm a college professor. Um, So, so I definitely, I, I assumed homeschooling would look very different than in fact, it, it actually ends up looking in our home. Um, (laughs) And I think I, I probably found it actually more looking at um, 
kind of moving from that attachment parenting realm into um, that kind of just seems to drop off um, when kids reach a certain age. And so I believe it was Sandra Dodd's website that I found first, and it was more um, about the whole life aspects of unschooling. And and then when I realized um, that I could take that into academics, um, I was just, I mean, honestly, I thought they were they were insane. <laughs> to begin with. Um, I thought all of it was pretty crazy. And, and I remember actually closing, you know, going down that rabbit hole and then very quickly closing windows. Like, I can't believe I'd, I'd even consider this <laughs> boundaries and rules and um, all this other stuff. But I was, you know, that seed was planted and, and mm-hmm. I was back probably within a few hours actually reading more and then turning it all off and then <laughs> back and reading more. And, um, but I think we probably came to unschooling from life first instead of from academics. Um, in terms of our family, it's Nora and I, and, um, her, her father and I are separated soon to be officially divorced. We've been separated for about three years. Um, and we're currently living with Nor's grandmother, my stepmother, we came back from Alaska about a year ago when my father was ill um, so that we could spend time with him. And then he passed away. And we, um, both Nor and and I and and also Sharon, Nor's grandma, just, we all just really wanted to stay together afterwards. So we're still here. um, And I'm not sure what's next. We're trying to figure that out. Well, it sounds like you've found a good spot right now, though. Yeah. You guys are comfy. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So the next question I wanted to ask you was, um, when did Noor develop type 1 diabetes, and what did that diagnosis time look like? And if you could just give a brief description of type 1 diabetes for our listeners. Sure. Um, well, type 1 is an autoimmune disease. Uh, it's where, I, I guess in the simplest terms, it's where a body's immune system attacks the insulin-producing beta cells in the pancreas. Uh, there's no cure. Um, diet, okra, uh, cinnamon, <laughs> apple cider vinegar, none of that stuff is, is going to get rid of type 1 diabetes. Um, it's completely different than type 2 in those ways. Um, they should definitely have separate names, um, although they both have to do with insulin production or resistance. Um, so it's an autoimmune attack, a constant ongoing autoimmune attack, um, on the body's, on the body's ability to produce insulin on those cells. I, it tends to, um, I think the average age of diagnosis is eight, um, which is how old Nor was when she was diagnosed. Although it, it does occur in newborns. Um, my brother's partner, her aunt was diagnosed in her seventies, um, wow. so yeah, it, it, um, it definitely age, you know, once you reach adulthood, that doesn't mean that you're, yeah. you won't get type one. It's true. Michael was 11. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it does, there's a genetic component, although, um, it's not, that's rarely actually the case, it seems. Um, although nor there is, um, type one does run in Nor's father's family, um, as well as a couple of other autoimmune conditions. Um, so she was eight and, um, she, all the classic, um, signs, drinking a lot, uh, losing weight. Um, and I, I'm sure you saw that with Michael, the weight loss is very, very fast. I think, yep. yeah, lost, <laughs> um, like 20% of her body weight in about a week. Um, yeah. But sleep, you know, sleeping, being very tired, drinking a lot, peeing a lot. Um, and, you know, it started with the drinking and we just, nor had always been well hydrated. So we just thought, well, she's being really active. And, um, but then she threw up one day, um, which we now know were, um, she had ketones, obviously, um, mm-hmm. which is where your blood becomes acidic because it can't handle um, the level of, of blood glucose and the body can't break down those carbohydrates anymore. Um, so she threw up one day and then a few days later, um, 
she just, she could barely wake up. Um, and she threw up again and a friend of mine, uh, thankfully who had had gestational diabetes, um, said, Brie, I, you need to Google type one diabetes. And I did. And I called her pediatrician and we were there in the office, um, within an hour and she was diagnosed there with a blood sugar check, um, just a simple finger prick. Um, anytime, this is where I kind of do my soapbox thing, but anytime a child is drinking a lot, urinating, tired, flushed, losing weight, vomiting, anything that looks like the flu, ask the pediatrician to just do a sim simple blood sugar check um, because it really is that easy to diagnose. Yep. Um, and we were sent directly from there to the, the large children's hospital in Philadelphia. Um, and she, Nora was in DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, and she was probably, probably just a few short hours away from a coma. Yeah. Yep. Michael, uh, same kind of thing. And the, the symptoms developed really quickly, which, mm -hmm. you know, also makes it seem flu-like almost, right? Right. Because it was maybe a, a week um, from when he, we started to notice, you know, when I looked back, I noticed, oh, he's drinking more. He's going to the washroom more. Nice. And, so, uh, yeah, we en ended up, just went right to the hospital. Yeah. Um, one one night, actually. Uh -huh. Because I, I heard him trip. And, uh, yeah, the same thing. His blood sugar was extremely high. Uh, we've got uh, different systems in the U.S. and Canada. Yes. <laughs> for, for numbers, so we won't do that. But, um, yeah, they found it there. And he was uh, in DK and, you know, spent a few days there. Mm. And uh, ah, that worked out well. Yeah. Um, yeah. But one There's of the things. Yeah. Slides, um, if. If kids aren't diagnosed, then they yeah. die very quickly, unfortunately. So, so yes, your list of uh, symptoms was perfect. Yeah. Um, one thing I did find was that during that time, there were lots of advantages for Michael not being in school. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to speak to some of the advantages that you and Nora found? Yes. So um, it was it was pretty evident immediately <laughs> that. Um, that I should be incredibly thankful that we live our life the way we do. Um, one of, I think, the hardest aspects of diagnosis for children is that overnight, uh, within the space of a few hours, they're, they go from um, not having a care in the world about the food that goes into their mouth to food being the center of their existence. Um, everything that they eat, as you know, has to be weighed or measured and calculated for an insulin dose. And it, from all of the conversations I've had and reading that I've done, it seems like the most common um, method at diagnosis to deal, the initial management of type 1 um, revolves around very, a very scheduled existence. Um, mm -hmm. depending on the insulins that are prescribed, that could mean having to eat a certain amount of carbs every, you know, X amount of hours, whether you want to or not. Um, but because we homeschooled and because um, the doctors were aware that I was with Nor all the time, we were able to, from the very beginning, um, move to a more I'm making air quotes here, um, complicated ma system of management where her life would basically, she'd still be able to eat when she was hungry and not eat when she wasn't. Um, and, and so we learned how to manage carbohydrates and insulin um, in a way that worked for her without it being regimented, uh, where if she would have been in school, they wouldn't have allowed us to start off that way. I know. I remember the doctor when he came in to at the hospital, and they were starting to talk about that. He and we told him that he homeschools and he's not in school. And he looked at me and he's like, "Well, you know what? It, they called it the flexible insulin management system." He yeah. goes, "You know, that's usually what we do with adults, yeah. but because he's not in school, we'll do that with him too." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was that. It was to go straight to. Um, 
to an IC to insulin carbohydrate, um, I think was really saved all of us, um, a lot of heartache, a lot of, a lot of the most difficult aspects of diagnosis. I think we, we got to avoid actually. Mm. Yeah. And then there's all the, you know, not homework and schoolwork aren't piling up on top of them. Oh, right. All, as well. Right? <laughs> right. And all the worry about them being low when they're away from you and you know, yeah. just all of that. And, and I think the other thing that was really clear from the get go was um, we had, we had facilitated an environment where nor listened to her body um, from the beginning. And if she was full, she stopped eating. If she was hungry, she ate. If she felt like sleeping, she slept. If she felt like being awake, she was awake. So I think that really, you know, our kids have to be so aware of how they feel all the time. Um, I think it, it was just fluid for her, um, to, to be in that head, in, in that space, to have that mind body connection. Um, the first time she went low, she recognized it. Um, and, and has, you know, since she's completely aware of her lows. Um, and I, I do believe that that kind of awareness for an eight year old is not necessarily commonplace all the time. Um, cause you, you learn in a conventional setting, we encourage children not to trust their bodies. Mm -hmm. So, or not to listen, um, you know, don't eat that. You'll, You'll ruin your appetite. Well, that's why I'm hungry. <laughs> well, yeah, it's six o'clock. It's time to eat now. Right. So, but, yeah, so that, that was really helpful. There were some challenges. I remember being really nervous at first about, you know, because you're monitored so closely, um, a conversation every day with the nurse over the phone and all the logging, you know, records every time they eat, every time they receive insulin, exercise, all that record keeping at first. And I remember being nervous about them seeing, um, you know, nor eating at midnight. <laughs> so, I mean, still, the, they're, they're always asking, so what time is it that you go to bed when they look at his logs, right? <laughs> yeah. Your breakfast is until like 10 or 11. <laughs> I know, I know. It's always funny. You know, they would say, wow, her numbers are just fantastic early in the morning. Most people have trouble with breakfast and, you know, while well, she's asleep. <laughs> she's not actually eating. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I, I mean, we found that too. Absolutely. That because we hadn't been controlling Michael's eating before, mm -hmm. that he was already following his body, that he was able to pick up messages. Like, as you mentioned with Nor, he, he can feel when he's going low. Mm -hmm. And uh, he can he can feel when he's going high. Mm -hmm. he knows what? Yes. Oh. Yeah, he knows what his blood his blood tastes different. You know, after he does a blood prick. Yep. When <laughs> when he he's high. His fingers too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and actually, we were talking about it at the karate tournament last uh, weekend because he notices. I mean, obviously, it's very it's very hard to perform when you're low, mm -hmm. so. Um, for him, performance-wise, high is better, yeah. um, and he can tell um, that clenching his like fists, clenching his muscles, is harder mm. when his blood sugar is higher. But that's it, you know. When you're not watching the clock and eating what you're told, you're listening to your body instead, and you're noticing all these connections, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Yeah. That, that's been so helpful for. Uh, ongoing management with that. Yeah. And there, I mean, it is in some ways it's a, it was a double edged sword before nor started using an insulin pump. Um, because there was that, that, you know, those few moments where we times where we'd given her insulin for a meal. I mean, that was, that was a difficult aspect. She had never had to think before she started eating, how much do I want to eat? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> how much do I want? Because all of it was dependent on on that injection, how much we would give her. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so there definitely were times where she, instead of going erring on the small side and then getting a second injection, if she was still hungry, um, Mm -hmm. she'd, you know, err on, on her eyes were bigger than her stomach. And, and then we'd be stuck having to, you know, have her drink lots of juice to make up for whatever insulin was already in her body. Um, But that all, all of those things were really just helped us know that we had to move towards an insulin pump faster than, than is normally done with kids her age in the U S anyway, other countries, not so much. Yeah, no, they had offered it soon. He, uh, I was probably for the first year he wasn't really interested in moving to a pump, but eventually he decided he wanted to try that. Mm-hmm. And now he's considering going back. But that's the thing, right? They they gain their yeah, experience and, and they see what works well for them. And, you know, all these things are options. Right, right. They're just tools. And exactly. the only rule is that you have to have insulin every day. <laughs> that's Yeah. Only. And there's so, I think I have a question about this later, so let's not get okay. <laughs> it. might be the next one. Okay. Um, but yes, you're right. <laughs> okay, so uh, next question here. Once we got a handle on the day-to-day management and it became more routine, um, I found it really important to shift our focus away from the illness and back onto all of Michael as a person. Mm-hmm. Did you find yourself making that shift as well? Oh my gosh. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and it really, you start to notice, well, I guess it probably it's, it, your awareness is there all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, that every conversation starts with, you know, what's your blood? Are you low? Let me check your blood. But you know, there's, <laughs> oh, it's just, it's, it's all diabetes all the time. Um, we were, we were really lucky. Um, when I became, I very quickly became unenamored by our large children's hospital here, which is one of the best in the country. Um, but it's a large children's hospital and everything is done by protocol. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and that I understand the reasons for that. Um, and I also wasn't willing to subject nor to being, um, to, to having to follow it. Um, so I knew from her experiences in the hospital that it, it felt very important to me to find a health provider who also had type one. Um, because I don't know, I don't understand, I don't get it. And I wanted Nora's provider to get it. Um, so we were very lucky and we found a pediatrician who's been type one for 50 some years and um, when we went to see him the first time, he, you know, he was just wonderful in every way imaginable. And he said, always, always child first, diabetes second. And, and that's, I think, so important. Um, so, yes, we had to, both Michael, Nor's dad, and I had to very consciously, you know, she was eight and she was at the age where she was just starting to um, really develop this sense of independence. We lived in the woods and she would go off with the dog alone and we wouldn't hear from her for a while. And all of a sudden that kind of stuff became no. Um, And so to be able to just use that, that unschooling mindset of thinking flexibly and how Mm -hmm. can we make all these things work now that other things have changed um, became crucial. And, and so that's how we, focused on Nora again. Um, who is she? What does she need? And how do we put diabetes in the background to make Nor just Nor somebody who has, you know, bunk beta cells? Yeah, it's just it's just a few more parameters that get added in. Right, right, right exactly. And the panic, I think, has to, you have to kind of deal with the diabetes for a little while so that the panic subsides Mm -hmm. and then you can do that. Um, because I mean, the panic is so strong at first. Oh yeah. (laughs) That's why I say once it becomes a bit more routine, because yes, I mean, you have to, you, you have to, um, learn, learn the information that you need. Right. Right. 
Right. Uh, once once you um, get a handle on on what's going on and what you can do, and you feel a bit more um, control over the situation, right, right, uh, then then your mind can can open up because because you can move past the fear. But if you stay stuck in the fear, right, and I I mean I see that okay. everywhere, Pam. I don't know how I've pretty much bowed out of any kind of type one diabetes parent groups, um, because that fear is just so prevalent and I, I, I can't, yeah, yeah, I just can't deal with it. And I do think, I mean, the way I deal with, um, any unknown is I intellectualize it, um, as an academic, right? So the first thing that I did when we got back from the hospital was I dove into research, um, and hit up all of my, geneticist, biologist, um, <laughs> you know, friends, um, friends like that to explain this to me, please. Um, and so that was a part of it too. I think I had to really wrap my head around physiologically what was going on in her body, mm-hmm. um, as much as I could. And then I was able to, once I got that and once I, I mean, I did ridiculous research, like, you know, the, more the dead and the true dead in bed statistics all <laughs> that phrase, but but I know them, you know, and I know that it's 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 really incredibly rare. Um, there are so many other things to worry about. I don't worry about that um, at, actually at all. Um, so, but I needed to know those numbers for myself, um, and I I think those. So that's how I. I moved back to, okay, this is, this is completely manageable. Um, so there's no need to make it the, the hyper-focus of our lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think you, you made a great point about um, switching up doctors, right? Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, I know we were, we were lucky that our, I mean, we're in a relatively small town. Um, so we went to, we ended up at the, the local hospital and the clinic there, but here, I just wanted, I, I thought I'd share a couple of the guidelines from the clinic um, that they have posted. They talk about um, supporting the choices uh, the person with diabetes makes without judgment and build a trusting relationship that empowers the person with diabetes to care for themselves to the best of the, their ability. So, I mean, because I know I've changed up other things for the kids over the years. If if this activity or this location doesn't work, we go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Um So we were lucky that we ended up somewhere that we felt comfortable with the way they treated Michael. And, you know, they talked to him. They didn't talk to me. Um, I mean, of course, they talked to me, but I mean, they they asked him. They they, he was the person managing his diabetes. It wasn't me controlling him. Right. Right. So, yes, for any anyone dealing with a chronic illness, if you're not happy with um, the the environment of the care and support that you're getting, just keep looking, keep looking. It's really worth it. Oh, it's so important to, you know, if you're managing a chronic illness, it it has to be a holistic approach, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we may talk about this later on in our conversation, but just especially with some of these chronic illnesses, especially with diabetes that's so food-centric, um, you know, the rates of, of eating disorders uh, in in adults who grew up with type one is off the charts, Mm -hmm. um, as is depression and anxiety. And I think we really can negate those risks by helping our kids feel in control and feel empowered. And, and by not trying to, to manage every little aspect, you know, our, um, (coughs) our doctor, he also says things like, you know, there are no good or bad numbers, right? Even just the language that you yep, use. Yeah. Um, it's just data. It's just data. Check, mm-hmm. Correct. Move on. You know, all that kind of stuff is is really, really important. Yep. It's it's just data to give you some clues of right. what's going on. Yep. Um, <clears throat> that that piece about in control, um, I think, is is really crucial too, because sometimes. I, I, I see them either either parents completely take over control mm-hmm. 
of it, or they insist that their kids do it all mm-hmm. the time because I'm teaching them responsibility to do it. Right, right. How you know? they ever be an adult if they don't do it now? It exactly. <laughs> so that was one thing I wanted to mention because I know at various times, you know, Michael just didn't he didn't feel like prepping his needles or or filling his pump or you know. And so I was happily offering to do all take all those little bits off his plate yes. when he didn't feel like he had the energy to do them. Yeah. And not not making him feel bad, not shaming him for it or making him feel guilty. Okay, fine, I'll do this or whatever, you know, just to 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 help them along um, to do what it what the extra stuff that's on their plate to deal with with whatever illness that they're dealing with. Right. It doesn't mean that you're going to be doing it till they're (laughs) 45. (laughs) No, in fact, it's the I think it's the opposite. Right. Exactly. It has to be a partnership. And that's, again, you know, that's the other thing that unschooling prior to diagnosis set us up for success. You know, it just, it, we were already living life in partnership with our child. So that transition to managing a chronic illness was, was pretty fluid. Um, There's a, there's a wonderful type one uh, and a pediatric endocrinologist also who's been type one, I think since he was eight years old. Um, uh, Dr. Stephen Ponder, I don't know if you're familiar mm-hmm. with him. Yep. And, and he, he talks a lot about this idea of partnership, how, and you know, it's, it's very much, it almost reminds me of Lelici in a sense um, mm-hmm. where, you know, it's, it's a dyad, but <laughs> <laughs> you know that, and then you throw diabetes in there. So it's you give as as much control as the child wants, and you're yes. always yeah. right there, you know, to to take it back and to do it for them. I wish, I, you know, I think about it sometimes. I think when I get the saddest is when I I have those moments of awareness that. This is the rest of her life. Um, I recently went out of town for a few days for the first time ever um, without Noor. And I went and I was so excited. I bought this tiny little purse Um, (laughs) because, you know, as a diabetes mom, you carry a big bag. Yep. Um, (laughs) So I bought this tiny little purse (laughs) that I haven't been able to carry, you know, in in years. And, um, And I was so excited. And in that moment of excitement, there was this, oh, gut punch um, that at least if the technology doesn't change as Nora gets older, and I know that it will, um, but for right now, she'll never be able to carry a tiny little purse like that, you know, or she could, but, you know, as long as she has her cargo pants on so they, you know, she can have her, her fruit chews in there or something or her pump. <laughs> You know, and, and it's that, it's that, God, let me do, I will do as much of this for as long as you want me to, because Mm -hmm. at some point I won't be there to do it for you. Um, yeah, it's my, it's my honor to, to carry as much of the burden as she's comfortable giving me. Mm -hmm. Um, and it changes all the time. Um, there are times where she absolutely, just doesn't want to have mom, will you just deal with this today? Um, yeah. absolutely. Of course I will. Or will you change my pump for me? You know, I would love to. Um, yeah. And then, you know, as she gets older, she's 12 now, uh, you know, for the most part, she really doesn't want me to do anything. <laughs> so yeah. when she does mm-hmm. ask, I'm very, very, you know, I'm, I'm happy. Yes, exactly. And <laughs> Speaking of I, your cargo pants comment, you know, I'm happy to try out, you know, uh, he found he found a jacket, a spring jacket or something, you know, online with tons of pockets. <laughs> it's amazing all the things he can fit in there. The you know, you just go for his vest or the fish. Yeah. <laughs> the door's got a thing for those. It's. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, I think we probably hit most of this, but um 
I one thing I just wanted to make sure to pull out was uh, this this next question I had here. When we look at how children learn through unschooling, uh, we see that the most effective learning happens when they have choices and control over their actions. Mm -hmm. And of course, that can seem scary when the consequences mm -hmm. are, are drastic and immediate. But even in this situation, I found that learning flows so much better when I don't take on that role of, of gatekeeper mm -hmm. because he's going to learn most effectively learn self-management by doing it, by making these choices and seeing the results. You know, if, if you know, I, we certainly don't have these conversations as much anymore as, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, when he was younger, you know, when we would take a carb count and, and, uh, and find out what his blood sugar is and, and what activities are coming up. And, you know, if I think maybe this dose would probably work and he thinks that dose, you know, we're going to go with that dose. Absolutely. Oh, right. Oh, I have been so humbled. <laughs> exactly. I have been so humbled by the, um, you know, I'm sure you guys have the same experience. You get home from the hospital and the first thing you do is you go and buy a food scale. Um, yeah. <laughs> and everything gets weighed. Um, not a sing I mean, I brought that thing with me to play dates, to on vacation. <laughs> I, I honestly, I brought it to restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was such like I, I was a, a freak at first. Um, and it's been four years now. I haven't carried a scale with me for about three. Um, but I, at this point. Just even a few nights ago, we bought a, a new food that we haven't had these honey sesame sticks. And we've bought the regular ones, but never the honey ones. And and Nor filled up a bowl and and um and I asked her how many carbs she thought, and she told me, and I said, Oh, I think you're way off. And, and so I dumped it out <laughs> and I waited. <clears throat> She was exactly right. <laughs> and that happens all the time. And I still, you know, I'm I'm human. I have flaws and I am a control freak. Um, so it that's that's something that I, I I mean we struggle with and all the time. But she's she's really good at laughing at me. Um and I always defer to her. Um I know she's right, even if I have to I feel like I have to have my say. Um, I know that chances are she's right. And if she's not, that's perfectly okay because that's how she learns. So there's, it, it really, it, it's uncanny actually. Um, and it goes back to that being in tune with her body, but you know, we'll have these charts of carb counts, right? Or carb factors for a certain food. But then if you mix that food with a different food, everything kind of changes, all bets are off and and there's, it's just this really complicated chemistry. Um, mm -hmm. And they, I'm guessing that Michael's like Nor in that they just know. Um, and if they don't know, their sense of it is way closer than ours. Mm -hmm. um, I, I find that just beautiful and fascinating at, at the same time. Um, but I think also mm -hmm. there's this, this aspect of gatekeeper or director that you mentioned just even in food choices. And I know both of us kind of cringe to talk about yeah. that because it's food again. <laughs> the question that gets, you know, dropped in unschooling forums all the time. Um, but I, I think, you know, going back to that, that high incidence of eating disorders when every morsel of food is in a sense controlled, um, I think it's really important to step back from, we know that, you know, uh, a, a slushy <laughs> is going <laughs> to, there's just no way that insulin can, that synthetic insulin can match the glycemic load and speed of, uh, you know, a slushy, <laughs> um, which is, you know, like an Italian water ice or something. I don't know if Canadians yeah. call them slushies, yeah. um, but there's just no way, right? We can do the best there we can do pretty good but they're still gonna probably hit the 200s um mm -hmm. or what would that be for you guys like, yeah i don't know nine, so <laughs> whatever right they're gonna go high um but 
And and I know that if she eats a big spoon of fat with it, like peanut butter or something like that, that that'll maybe slow it down a little bit. And she knows because I've told her and she's experimented. Um, but they they still have to eat the slushy if they want it with or without that spoon of fat to slow it down because that's that's how they learn. And that's how that's how you come to make choices that are the best for you. Um you know, I read about kids, parents going into kids with type one, going into their rooms and finding, you know, all of these candy wrappers or empty sugar bags you know, yeah. in the closet or under the mattress. And, and it just, it just breaks my heart. And I know you have a question about trust and, and that's. Yeah, that's coming up. Well, <laughs> yeah. It's so, it's all just so bound together. Um, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. But, because uh, who, who better to learn? I mean, can you imagine them having, because they're making choices. You're taking away their ability to learn and they're going to be making choices against your control. Right. Rather than choices that work for them, no matter which they know, right? Right. Well, if they think they're going to be judged or shamed, exactly. and then that's where lying and sneaking come from. If you're... We'll just call this question A because that was the next one. We talk a lot about building trust uh, uh, in a relationship with our children with unschooling, free of judgment and shame. And have you found that to be a valuable foundation for your days? Why, well, yes. Yes. <laughs> it's probably the most valuable, right? I think. Exactly. If anything, that is, that's the gold star for unschooling. Right? <laughs> um, and it goes back to partnership, of course, right? You can't be in partnership with somebody you don't trust. Um, and so nor has to trust that I'm on her side. Um, and that no matter what, I will help her figure out a way to make whatever it is that she wants to do happen as safely and sanely as possible. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that she can tell me the truth. You know, we've always had an agreement. It's, there's no, no bad will come from the truth. Um, we might, you know, have some uncomfortableness, um, but, but I'll, I, I won't be angry. Um, you won't get punished. Not that she's ever been punished anyway, but you know, there's not, but yeah, there's not, gonna... they still know it's possible. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't help if I don't know. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's... that's it. It trust keeps your lines of communication open. Yeah. Right. Yep. You yeah. You can exactly. always and... talk back. Like trust means that, that I, it's trust both ways too. Right. For, for me, if I'm, uh, have a question or I'm uncomfortable or, of something or, you know, what are your plans for this? You know, he's happy to answer me mm -hmm. just as much as he knows that he, ha if he has a question, he can come to me and we will always figure out a way to make what he needs or wants happen. Right. 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 Exactly. And, and even in those rare times where it has to be a in the moment, mm, this this can't happen right now. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. they also trust us that it will happen as soon as it can happen, whatever that means. Um, yeah, I think sometimes people get confused, um, thinking that it, it always means yes right away. You know, without right, any yeah. thought and conversation. No, a, a, a trusting relationship and helping them do what they want to do means we take all these factors into consideration and together we come up with a plan, you know, to, to do it. It may not be, you know, this afternoon. It may not be today. It may be next week. But we've all worked together to come up with a plan that works within the parameters that we all know that we have. It's so yeah. different than, than just being like permissive or something. Well, because that's just as thoughtless, I think. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. right. Yeah. It's back to that whole, you know, big scope, flexible yeah, thinking. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And looking at the bigger picture. Right. Right. And, and like you've mentioned a few times, the long view, right? Um, mm -hmm. This chances are there is not going to be a cure in our children's lifetime. As long, as much as we want to believe there will be, 
I personally don't think that there will be. I think that technology will increase to such an extent um, that it'll feel very much, very, that it'll become a lot different. Um, mm-hmm. and, and there won't be as much thought involved on a day-to-day, moment-by-moment basis. Um, but in any event, this is something this is something that they're going to be dealing with for, you know, chances are the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. And, and we didn't talk about burnout at all. Um, but I think that that's that trust, um, and also the ability to know that it's okay to, to make a mistake, to mess up, or even it's okay to make a choice that, you know, isn't really the best choice, but it's the one you want to make. Yep. Um, Yep. All that stuff, you need to have room for all that stuff. So, Mm -hmm. because it's no, it's just, yeah, the long, it's, we're in it for the long haul. Yeah. This next question, I think we've, we've kind of, we've touched on as well. It's been a fun conversation. (laughs) Um, This one, I was just moving forward a bit into the teen years and as they, as they get older, um, they start to spend more time away from, from their parents Mm -hmm. and, and in reaction to if their diabetes management or any chronic illness management has been so closely controlled by the parents, um, that, that time when they're out from under their parents' gaze can seem like freedom from all of it. And, and they're going often, I see them making choices that are in reaction to the release of control, rather than I'm not even, I'm not even going to think about it and come up with my own plan. I'm just going to do the opposite of, you know, because I I can, because now I finally can. Right. (laughs) Right. And I mean, we see that all the time and research actually confirms that, that the, the kids who have the worst possible outcomes at, with this specific chronic illness, the ones who end up back in the hospital in DKA um, time and time again, who have the highest A1C numbers, are the ones who come from either a completely hands-off environment where the parents are like, your disease, you deal with it. You deal with it. Or the Mm -hmm. ones who are gatekeepers, um, who are are just managing, micromanaging every little aspect. Um, And that's exactly what happens. Those kids get out from under the gaze, uh, their parents' gaze, and it's not even a thoughtful you know what? I really want a slushy and I don't care that I'm going to be 200. <laughs> it's, yeah. um, slushy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah slushy. And then maybe, hmm, maybe so they don't know I'm going to, you know, test my, uh, my, um, what control solution. So they don't know that that's uh-huh. what my number was. And, or, you know, the, the kids who actually decide that they want to, be exist, you know, live on that edge of ketones and DKA. Um, Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, it's just, it's, it's horrifying and terrifying. Um, And I think that all comes from that, you know, as a college professor, I see that even just without chronic illness, but the kids who've been the most controlled in their families, they hit their freshman year of college and it's, whoa, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah. It, oh, yeah. I, I saw lots of that. Girlfriends, too. drugs, all kinds of crazy, <laughs> insane stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Freedom. Sandra Dodd talks about that or... or I, she talks about it, I'm sure, all the time still, but I remember that really hitting me um, when I first started reading about unschooling, how really what we should think of is all of these little, giving them the power, the control, the chance to make teeny tiny decisions from the very beginning, because those decisions add that that confidence, that ability, that trust, all that builds and builds and builds until one day, you know, they're teenagers and they're faced with some really huge, um, decisions and, and we want them to have experience making all kinds of choices. Exactly. Yeah. When the, when the consequences aren't big, right? Right. Exactly. When it's, or when you're right there with them to, to answer their questions and everything. Exactly. Little, little small consequences and a huge safety net. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Yeah. Because I mean, decision-making is a skill, right? Absolutely. Exactly. It's like common sense, right? It's not common and it's not, 
innate. Both are learned. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I think that's what our kids have really great experience learning is both, both common sense and, and decision making and looking ahead and, and also how to deal with, Ooh, well, that wasn't the best choice. Mm-hmm. What do I do now? <laughs> oh, exactly. Yeah. 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 But, it's just another decision. Right. Exactly. Right? It's just new, it's, new information has come in and, and. They can they can gain experience years and years of experience with that as they grow up. Yeah. Right. Well, and it's yeah. like you know we were talking about not looking at good or bad numbers. Just it's just data, um, mm-hmm. and I think it's the same thing with our, with those decisions, right? It's, yeah. It's just information. It's input, and you learn from it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so our experience has been, nor um, she's I I really. She's 12, so she's not, you know, she's right there. Not quite, the yeah. Um, but she's very, she's very truthful. Um, I don't think there's, she has any reason not to be. Um, mm-hmm. And she doesn't, you know, she doesn't go crazy um, unless she goes crazy. <laughs> and then <laughs> she usually lets me know that that's happening um, yeah. if she's not with me. So, you know, I'll, I'll get a text message with a picture of the slushy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's that self-awareness piece, right? They know. <laughs> this is about to happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that leads nicely into the last question I have here. Um, as they get older and their life expands, as you mentioned, you recently uh, had your first uh, extended trip away, right? Mm-hmm. And and new fears c- crop up yeah. like that. Um, I know Driving. from first first. Oh, I was just about to say, <laughs> Michael's going to be driving on his own in the next month or two. <laughs> so he's been driving me around for the last uh, few months and has done his driver's ed. And so and we have a graduated license here in Ontario. So there's two stages. So now he's ready to go and get his second stage, which will he'll be able to drive on his own as well. Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to talk a bit about how you process through these fears as you come up. I know you mentioned um, intellectualizing them, you know, getting the facts and all the information. And I think that's been a huge piece for me as an engineer. I'm kind of into that (laughs) kind of thing, too. Um, The other thing that helps me is just to when my imagination starts Mm -hmm. to go wild. It's just reminding myself that nothing's cast in stone about the future right and to not base my decisions that I make today based on you know future um wild imaginings yeah like are are not good and and I've seen that all over the place and it's just reminding myself that this is the same fear as any other kind of fear you know unschooling uh, can they ever get to call you know all the typical fears when you first look at unschooling you go through the same kind of thing here yeah that like that kind of imagination game right? yeah. where what's the worst that could happen well, exactly could happen and peel that apart and hmm, maybe it's really not that horrible when we look at it that way um yeah I, I do that too honestly I think um for me, what helps the most, and this is going to um, definitely enunciate my control, um, <laughs> <laughs> my control tendencies, is technology. Um, Nor uses a continuous glucose sensor, the Dexcom okay. G5, mm-hmm. um, which means that I have constant, continuous access to her blood glucose values. I see them in real time, um, even if I'm ten thousand miles away, mm-hmm. and. So for me, um, uh, honestly, I don't know that I would be able to let go as gracefully. Um, I would still force myself to do it, but it wouldn't be as pretty um, <laughs> without yeah. that that technology there. I know that I can always text her and say, hey, <laughs> you paying attention, you're low. Um, or I can text someone she's with and say, hey, <laughs> Nora's really low. Um, has she had some juice or something? Mm-hmm. Um, I had a, I, I actually got to experience not having that um, 
lifeline, if you want to call it that. We went to Costa Rica uh, about a month and a half ago, and Nor went, Nor went scuba diving, which has been a dream of hers for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And um, she was underwater for an hour. <laughs> ah, yeah. I th I saw pictures, and I thought of that when I saw your pictures on Facebook. <laughs> uh, so that was probably the longest that I have been. I mean, and sometimes you know the the technology isn't working right, or sometimes she says I don't want to wear the technology. So there are other times when she's without mm -hmm. all that stuff, um, but. But she was, you know, 40 feet under the water or whatever. Um, yeah, and I had no idea what was going on. Um, and I didn't know she'd be down that long. Honestly, I thought they'd go down for like 10, 15 minutes and come uh. up and we'd check blood. And and when I, <laughs> before they jumped off, you know, when her, her dive instructor said, see you in an hour. <laughs> I nearly vomited off the side of the boat. Um, and thankfully the boat captain was there and, and he kept me talking. Um, but I, I really, I was physically, it was, yeah. it was the hardest hour of my adult life, I think. Um, and then she came back, you know, to the surface with the biggest smile I have yeah. ever seen on her face. And, and that, that cockiness for lack of a better word, that self-assurance that, you know, she knew that she had been somewhere where very few people in the world have ever been. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it just stayed with her for, I, it's still with her, you know? And, and so that was a really important experience uh, for her, obviously, but for me too, um, because I, I just, I have to, I have to always know that, um, that it's like you said, it's going to be okay. Um, stretching your comfort zone. A bit. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> and how? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so I would say, yeah, the technology, um, and even when it's not available, <laughs> that's good too, because it, it stretches me to, into that place of imagining my worst fears and realizing that they're really just, just that kind of ungrounded fear. Um, and, you know, we both know because of all the research we've done into the endocrine system, we both are fully aware of what that does to us, right? On a hormonal level, that, that cortisol, <laughs> that adrenaline, yeah. <laughs> and it stops us from thinking rationally. So mm -hmm. knowing all that in the moment, I think is also really helpful too. Like this is Brie, <laughs> this is Brie having a completely irrational hormonal fear response. Um, and what do I need to do to get through that? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Those are the. Yeah, but driving, we get I enough experience. <laughs> Some kind of like. We have so many juices yourself. and tablets in the car. <laughs> it's like they're going to be really close. Yeah. I mean, he's he's a great driver. And, and, you know, they have, you know, guidelines here. You know, what your blood sugar has to be. And if it's below this. You have to wait 45 minutes right. before you can drive. So I, and, and that's the other, you know, just to um, not see those. That's the other thing is to make sure you place those not as they're trying to stop you from right. doing things, right? Because then you feel like anyone wants anyone to rebel wants against to somebody who's trying to control right. them, exactly. right? Yeah. But no, these are, you know, guidelines for, for yourself, for, you know, because... You're right. When when things get out of whack, you sometimes you don't think straight, right? Right. No, you can't. I mean, that's yeah. being out of whack, right? Exactly. <laughs> literally. <laughs> so yeah, I, I see. I, I remember seeing that a lot on the on the parent forums. That you know, checking how do I get my teen to check his blood sugar before he gets in the car? And and again, I think it's when you come from a place of. Uh, <laughs> When, when your life isn't over, you know, just oversaturated with all of these rules, um, mm -hmm. then the ones and for, you know, principles, rules, whatever you want to call them, um, protocol, it, 
it it's not nefarious, right? It's not meant to thwart you. It's not this thing standing in the way of you and what you want. It's it's completely different. You're right. It's this protective element. Um, exactly. It's just if, if, but if your parents have been telling you, check your blood sugar, check your blood sugar, check your blood all the time, all that right. time growing up, it doesn't feel it's, it doesn't feel like something in your control, something that you're doing for yourself to help yourself, right? Right. So, right. yeah, right. It's just somebody it's else's the wrong perspective. Or, <laughs> or yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah, you need to get you need to trust and give them the control over themselves because then the actions that they're taking, they know they're doing them for themselves, not to satisfy someone else because it's their health that it's about. Right. So if you keep telling them what to do, they're doing it to satisfy you, it's not doing it to take care right. of themselves. Yeah. Right. They're either doing it to make us happy or to avoid punishment. <laughs> exactly. And, and their health isn't even in the equation there right. in their heads. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, um, it's been an hour, Bree. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak. With it me. was wonderful talking to someone else who who lives this. <laughs> When, yes, you're so much nice. farther ahead on your journey too i'm sure when north starts driving <laughs> yes get in touch no problem <laughs> <laughs> and before we go um where's the best place for people to connect with you online is there a spot you hang out um i'm on facebook occasionally uh not so much these days because life is really pretty busy um mm -hmm. but facebook is probably probably the easiest Excellent. Thanks very much again. That was wonderful. My pleasure, Pam. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. You can also get your free Exploring Unschooling ebook at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash exploring unschooling. If you'd like to connect, you can also find me on Facebook at Living Joyfully. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.